If you have your Bibles, we are in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll be finishing up 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. Uh, we've been on that now for the third week. And in it, Paul is addressing some concerns about the resurrection. Evidently, there were some at Corinth that didn't really believe in the resurrection or think that it was that important. And you say, well, how could that be? Well, just kind of think of what some of the, the faith uh, drifts into today. You know, this idea of what the Christian faith is. Some people don't like the idea of resurrection because that's supernatural, and we know in our scientific world, supernatural doesn't happen. So you come up with a very symbolic faith where the resurrection just symbolically represents the way we can come alive as people if we believe in this thing, and it really didn't happen, but it's there just as kind of an illustration, kind of a metaphor to describe what we can become as we rise ourselves up through faith. Well. That probably was something like that was going on in Corinth because Paul spends a lot of time talking about how important the resurrection is. First of all, two weeks ago, at the beginning of the chapter, he talks about how it is absolutely crucial to the gospel. If you take the resurrection away from the gospel, basically he says, our faith is worthless and we are the most, to be the most pitied of all people on the face of the earth. Take away the resurrection, we have nothing because our faith is a real world historic faith. It's a heavenly faith, but it's also a real world faith. It's not just symbolic. This Jesus really came. He really did what the Bible says he did. He really said what the Bible says he said. And he really proved that he was in fact God in the flesh. He really did die. He really did rise again from the dead and ascended into heaven with the promise that he is really coming back. That's the Christian faith. It's not metaphorical. It's not symbolic. It's a real world faith. That's what Paul's saying here. If the resurrection didn't happen, our faith is worthless. It's nothing. It's a bunch of talk. It's a psychological head trip. Nothing more. He says, no, our faith is different than all that stuff. It is a faith that fulfills its promises in the real world. And as we come to the, towards the end of this chapter today, he gets into exactly how things will happen, the resurrection. Evidently, there are some crazy ideas floating around Corinth about what the resurrection would be about, how it would happen. What about these bodies? There's probably some ideas from the Old Testament that maybe like in Ezekiel, those dry bones which pop up and all of a sudden the, the flesh starts growing on them again. And some of those ideas that it would be the exact same body, which would lead to all kinds of weird ideas about, well, then what do you do with the bed? How do you bury them? What if somebody gets just, you know, burned up or something or, or dismembered? Then what's going to happen then? They're going to come back with one arm. You know, you can imagine all the, the, the things that would happen once you take. By the way, that view is what did have a, a place in our history in one of the reasons why we're so careful about burial. The idea that Christians should be opposed to cremation came from this strange idea of what the resurrection is going to be, that these same bodies are going to you know, put on flesh again. Uh, it would be kind of interesting today because we not only put them in boxes, we seal those boxes in sealed concrete uh, boxes, which is, is an, an interesting uh, cultural thing that we have when you really think about it. I guess after watching the play last night, maybe it's to prevent zombies. I don't know. It went to the the play of the kids put on. Never, never mind. At any rate. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, Paul's saying, we got, I want you guys to get this right. So we're going to learn today what's, what this resurrection is all about. What are our bodies going to be like? Except don't get too excited. We're not going to get very specific because we can't handle specific. We have nothing to compare it to. We can only imagine. That's kind of a prelude to the final song, by the way. So as we go to uh, this passage now in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 35, we, we read, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And what kind of a body do they come? You fool! He starts out by saying, you got your, The things you're discussing, the way you're discussing them, the ideas you have are foolish. Okay? You're so concerned about exactly the details of what kind of a body and how exactly it's going to happen. I'll give you a clue. It's a mystery. But, but here's, here's what we do know. You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body just as he wishes. To each of the seeds, a body of its own. He says, it's kind of like 
agriculture. He's trying to describe this, and he's got just, okay, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like agriculture. That seed has to die before it becomes what it is. And by the way, the plant that comes is nothing like the seed. The resurrection body is nothing like this body. Now, it may look like this body. If Jesus is our example, it looks just like this body, complete with holes and where his wounds were. But that's in looks. He says that it's like a, a seed. It goes in, it dies, it comes up something completely different. Then he goes on to talk about the differences of bodies. Uh, verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another of fish. There's even differences in what we see, or complete differences. You know, fish are really different than us. By the way, you ever seen the pictures of those fish that live way down in the very, very depths of the sea that we didn't even really knew existed until we had little submarines that went down there with lights and cameras and, and discovered these creatures that are just almost like cartoonish? They're 80% they're mouth with a little light that dangles to attract things so they can eat them. And if you tried to pull them up, by the way, they would explode. They're, they're, they live in pressure like we cannot imagine at the bottom of the sea. Just, there's all kinds of to totally different creatures here on Earth. He says, okay, so get used to the idea of, of different types of bodies. Let's go into space, verse 40. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of one heavenly is one, the glory of the earthly is another, the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars. Star differs from star as to glory. Look at the difference between the moon and the sun. That's kind of like the difference going to be with these bodies and our resurrected bodies. So he's using examples of what we know, agriculture, animals, space, to talk about dramatic differences in what God makes and what God has out there. So where's he going with all this? Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. Okay, now he's getting specific. What do we know about the resurrection? This is when we will rise. This isn't just talking about the resurrection of Jesus. This is talking about our future in Christ, our future resurrection. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised imperishable. Everything about these bodies we're walking around in is perishable. We are staying alive because our lungs are pulling in and out oxygen. Our heart is pushing it through our our circulation system to feed all these cells which must be fed oxygen or they will perish and all these cells are in the process of perishing and replacing themselves we replace every cell in our body on a regular basis someone in the medical science could tell me exactly how long it is before every cell in the body is basically replaced it's going on all of our lives our bodies are winding down like a battery you buy a battery it works fine but it starts winding down it goes out you get a new one some of you are more aware than others of this winding down of your body. It's called aging. We're all involved in this process. It's perishable. The bodies will be raised imperishable. In other words, they will not have a cell structure like we have that needs to be fed, that needs to be replenished, that needs to replace itself. Now, you can, you can think about that and, and just contemplate Okay, imperishable. That means we really don't need to breathe because that's what keeps us alive from perishing. Maybe we won't need to breathe. Maybe we won't need to sleep because sleep is part of that replenishing process. These bodies need rest. They wind down. They need refreshment. That's the perishableness. I just invented a word, didn't I? Uh, again, that's speculation, but I mean, he's talking about some radical things that we have no concept of imperishable. Those resurrection bodies will not have cells like we know. We'll know. We know nothing of what they will be. Everything we know is perishable and perishing. Everything around us, even these chairs, they're on their way out. They're wearing down. There's cells involved. Cells break down. Imperishable. Wow. I better go on here. We'll be taking too long on this. But the first thing he talks about is perishable to imperishable. Verse 43, sown in dishonor raised in glory, sown in dishonor. This flesh we are walking around in is sin-prone. It is fallen. It is cursed. Not only is it physically perishing, it is dishonored. 
will be raised. And the word he uses is glory. Isn't that interesting? Verse 43, sown in dishonor, raised in glory. We will have a glory to us. We will share the glory of God. By the way, there, there's some passages that give some people trouble in Scripture that says that we will one day share in divine nature. The Bible teaches that. This is what it's talking about. It doesn't mean we're going to be little gods or God in any way, but we will share his glory. We will have a glory that only God has now. Imagine that. What does that look like? We don't know. Right now, all we know is dishonor. These, these fleshly bodies were walking around. Inside of these dishonored fleshly bodies, he has placed his spirit. That's redemption. Right? That's the new birth. And that Holy Spirit is working on us. But these bodies are never going to move beyond dishonored, this flesh, until we're glorified. See what that word is say? We'll be glorified. What does that mean? I don't know, but that's what it says. Until we know instead of dishonor, we know glory. The end of verse 43, sown in weakness, raised in power. These bodies are weak. We know that. Even the strongest. Raised in power. Then we will have power like we know nothing of today. That's the resurrection. From weakness to power. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It has raised a spiritual body. This natural body, we are of nature. We're carbon-based. We're made of dust. To dust we return. Not so in the resurrection. We're not going to be carbon-based, these bodies, these resurrection bodies that we have. And by the way, the Bible teaches a bodily resurrection. Not carbon-based like these. Not natural, but spiritual. Now, immediately our minds go, okay, wait a minute, because we think of spiritual, we think of disembodied. No. No. I mean, spirits, yeah, spirits here on this physical earth are disembodied. But in the spiritual realm, there's bodies. We're going to have, it's going to be a spiritual body. Does that even fit into your mind? See, Paul, they're, they're trying to figure out all these, these wait, what's the body going to be like and thinking in human terms. And, and Paul is breaking them right out of any human terms you could possibly have. This is a natural body. It's going to be a, we're going to have spiritual bodies. We are going to be able to dwell in the spiritual realm, the heavenlies. We'll have that ability to be there, to see that, to comprehend that, to live there. If we went there today, we'd fry. It'd be like those, those strange fish at the very depths of the ocean. If you brought them up, they'd explode without that pressure. We'll be able to be there at that point. From a natural to a spiritual, verse 45, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Right now in this body, we are of Adam. We are of his lineage. We are of his stuff. Then, in the resurrection, we will be of Christ. We are of Christ only spiritually now, by his Holy Spirit living within us. We are of Christ. We can say that. That's true. But we're walking around these bodies that aren't. Then, our fullness will be of Christ, not of Adam. The first man was of the earth, 47. Earthy, the second is from heaven. Right now we're earthy, carbon-based, made of dust. Then we will be heavenly. Verse 48, as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. As is heavenly, so are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. That's what it talks about when it says we will share in the divine nature. Not that we'll be God, but there's some ways in which we'll be like him. In glory. Heavenly. Now, did that tell you specifics? No, it probably stretched your mind a little bit. We don't know. We, we, we don't have... Anything within us to, to make that comparison. Everything we know is earthy and weak and, and, in, and perishing. But we will go from perishable, dishonored, weak, natural, of Adam and earthy to glory, glorified, powerful, spiritual, of Christ and heavenly. That's what we will be. That's all the specifics we can give. Because in truth, we can only imagine with what we have now to think with, 
we're thinking with this, this blob of carbon-based flesh that is dishonored by nature. That's what we used to think with. Now, the Spirit of God enlivens that? Yes, absolutely. And so that we can think good thoughts and true thoughts and spiritual thoughts, and we should be more and more as we grow in him. But the bottom line is that there's still some weakness there that we cannot overcome until we're glorified. It says in another place, then we shall know as we have been fully known. Wow. That's a mind expansion also. So that's the best Paul can do with what we will be. He says, all your little speculations are foolish. Here's the real deal. It's going to be nothing like you can even imagine now. Now, how will this take place? Well, we will be changed together. Let's go on to verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We can't live there. We can't, can't dwell in his presence. It can't happen. Behold, I tell you a mystery, which is to say, you're not going to fully understand this, but here you go. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, aside from being an excellent phrase to put on the wall of a nursery, got that one? We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Uh, <laughs> it is a wonderful truth about our future. When he says not all will sleep, not all will die. See, the resurrection is the resurrection of the dead. When the resurrection of the dead happens, there will still be some that are not dead yet. So this is what he talks about here. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Changed into what? Well, changed from perishable to imperishable, from dishonored to glorious, from weak to powerful, from natural to spiritual, from of Adam to of Christ, from earthy to heavenly. That's the change he's talking about. That will take place not in the evolutionary process of billions of years like, wink, wink, our earth was created. You heard the wink, wink there, didn't you? Okay, just want to make sure. But in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just like that, we will be changed. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed into imperishable. By the way, that is a moment that is further described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, which says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who have passed away, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. There's that trumpet again. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. There's the full story there from 1 Thessalonians. That's that moment, that twinkling of an eye, when we will be raised or, if we're fortunate enough to be alive then, be changed in midair as we are taken up to join together at that one moment. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, death was defeated on the cross of Christ, but it hasn't been consummated yet. We're still dying. We're still aging. We're still walking around these perishable bodies. Now, we know we will not perish. We know that death is only the death of this body. And from best we can figure out in Scripture, we go immediately into the presence of the Lord spiritually, awaiting the resurrection. Again, we don't know how to explain that fully. But then that one day, we will be raised bodily in those totally different bodies. Then will be the day of victory over death. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Revelation chapter 20, no, chapter 20. Very interesting. Beginning with verse 11. Then I saw the great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. 
And the sea gave up the dead where they were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Death itself was thrown into the lake of fire. Interesting statement. By the way, I have to add the last verse of that chapter. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What's in the lake of fire? The devil, all of his demons, all those whose names are not written in the book of life, and death itself. That's the end of death. It's over. It's swallowed up in victory, is the way Paul says it in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? That, by the way, quote from Hosea. The sting of death is sin. On that day, death will be defeated. Sin will be done away with completely. There will be no sin, no potential for sin, not even a thought of it. Perfection, like God, no sin. We know nothing of that. Everything we know is tinged by, by sin. Then it will be done away with. The power of sin is in the law. We will not need a law on that day. We will not need rules to keep us in line. We will not need encouragement, and we will not need to guard ourselves because there will be no sin. As we walk on this life as a Christian, we need to guard ourselves. We have to apply some principles of discipline. We have to study the Word. We have to hang out with Christian fellowship. We're in danger. We could fall. The Bible says, he who thinks he stands, take heed. Don't think you're good enough to just gut it out and do it on your own. We need each other. We need help. We need some rules. We need the Word of God. We need encouragement. We need accountability. That day, no. Sin's gone. We can't even imagine it. But that's what it says. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. The full victory, fully accomplished, fully realized in the presence of God in these new bodies that know nothing of sin or death or weakness or any of those things. That's our future, by the way. That is our future in Christ. That's the promise. That's what's ahead of us. That's what's guaranteed through the gospel of Jesus Christ to them who believe. It's not just a, a better life here on this earth. That may or may not be. God's choicest people down through the ages were murdered for their faith. Don't expect that life will go good because you're a Christian here on earth. There are many, many blessings, but you know what? There's trouble. Nothing but trouble. But there's a day coming when all that will be gone, and it is ours as sure as his coming the first time as sure as his dying and raising from the dead and ascending to heaven, as sure as his second coming, when that shofar blows, we will be called together with all those who have gone before us from the very first of the Old Testament times to the very last one who comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. United in eternity, in perfection beyond what we can even imagine today. That's our destiny. So, verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. Don't let the groanings of this world shake your faith. Don't let modern philosophies and modern scientific stuff and the way our world's going cause you to lose your steam. Be steadfast unmovable, unshakable in your faith, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't quit giving everything you have to serve the Lord, even if it's very, very unpopular in culture, even if it gets you in trouble, even if it gets you killed, like it did 11 to the 12 apostles, by the way. Don't let that shake your faith. Why? Because look what's ahead. This life is nothing. This life is a, a snap. It's a vapor, here and gone. Do you know what eternity is? It's a long, long time. And that was an understatement. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. 
even though it might seem like it. It might seem like it. It's not. Because that day is going to come. He will come again. That shofar will blow. And we will become imperishable. Glorious, powerful, heavenly, spiritual, fully and completely of Christ. Of Christ's stuff. Sharers in the divine nature. That's our destiny. So be encouraged. Steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's pray.